Hello and welcome to a new series, possibly a series, I don't know, called Editing and Mixing the Orchestra by Adam Lansky, that's me. For once, a video where you don't have to see my face. So, uh, this video is, as it says, going to cover editing and mixing. We are not going to really talk too much about recording the orchestra, as that's a whole other set of skills that uh, I'm not sure how many people are into. Maybe if I get a lot of questions on this video, I'll post some stuff about that. Um, let's get to it. So we're looking at Logic Pro here. This is Logic Pro 9, which is what I use for recording everything, uh, basically. I'm not a fan of Logic Pro 10. We're not here to talk about that. I'm still using 9, and I'm happy with it. Um, before you get started on this kind of thing, you may want to get a cup of water, get some coffee, or use the restroom, maybe kick around a soccer ball for a half hour, because you're going to be here for a while. There's a lot more that goes into this than you might think, despite how simple it is. So, first of all, let me tell you what you're looking at here. Um, these are your regions, this is what we've recorded, and these are two stereo files. Uh, this says Mojave ORTF right here, which is our main pair of microphones. It's a matched pair of Mojave MA-101s that are set in ORTF at the center of the orchestra behind the conductor. And on the flanks here, we've got a pair of small Omni microphones made by Audix. They're the 1255BO microphones. Uh, if you'd like to know more about these microphones, contact Mojave or Audix, or someone who sells them. Um, I could talk about them, but I'm not going to. So, we've recorded rehearsal, and that's what you'll see right up here. On this timeline, we've got some notation as to what is going on. And we can see that rehearsal ends right here with fine one, movement two, movement three, etc. And then we have just these large blocks of audio. I always record rehearsal for two reasons. Number one, we need to set levels. Levels need to be set precisely. If you're going to be performing to perfection on stage, your engineer needs to record to perfection. And so the engineer should rehearse with the orchestra. That's first of all. Second of all, um, in case something goes terribly wrong during the actual performance, we have something to fall back on. In case an airplane smashes into the building, and if the orchestra can hold it together and keep playing, you can edit in from rehearsal when the airplane uh, enters the building. Or perhaps there's just a fire alarm or a baby. Anyways, we don't need any of this right now, so the first thing I'm going to do is highlight that and just mute that. In Logic, you just do that by pressing the M key on your keyboard. So now that lets us focus on uh, the, the remainder of the performance here. And what are these pieces? Well, right over uh, here, excuse me, I have our program. And so now I can reference the names of the pieces and make sure that I split them up properly. Uh, every now and then we'll have a piece with an ataka movement that can sometimes be difficult to distinguish, but here everything looks pretty clear cut. And I can even zoom in. Let's take a look at this Mendelssohn. So this looks like, uh, okay, that's some tuning up and someone slamming a book or perhaps punching their neighbor. Um, and then the piece actually begins right here. So if I want to, I can come over onto our markers and I can pull down on this just so it's about three or four seconds before the actual piece begins. Something that's really cool in Logic, if you hold the command key and you click 
on one of the uh, markers here, it will take you to the marker. And so I can more precisely place these things just by command clicking. And pull this guy down. A nice easy way to scroll left and right in this window is to hold shift and rotate that mouse wheel. And that's typically how I move around uh, because dragging this bar can be, it can work, it can be a little too fast sometimes. So I'm going to just sort of get these markers in a nicer place right here just so that I can very easily jump to a section and it's ready to go. This saves on time. The Riley is just one single movement, so that's already in place. And let's take a look at this fine here. Uh, a neat way to zoom in using your magnifying glass is on the keyboard, if you hold Control and Option, your magnifier comes up, and then you can just click and drag over what you want to zoom in on. So let's take a look. This is going to be applause or tuning or perhaps flatulence. And yeah, it's just a bunch of human digestive sounds. So let's go ahead and move this fine marker up just a little more here. Speaking of human digestive sounds, I sincerely hope that this microphone isn't picking up all of mine. And do the same thing for fine too. And let's check out fine three. Let's see here. Back that up a little bit. And the final movement, pun not intended. Great, so all of our movement markers are in place. And anytime I want, I can just command click and it's gonna jump me to where we're going. At this point, I'm gonna hit save. It's good to save and to save obsessively. So, down here, for those of you that are not super familiar with Logic, uh, to get this little window open, this is our mixer. You can just hit X and it'll pop that up and down. If you prefer to have the mixer on an independent window, you can hit Command 2 or go up to Window Mixer. And then you've got it here on an independent window. And you can use the Command and Tilde key to scroll back and forth between the two of these. Considering we're only working with two tracks that are stereo, I just leave up our mixer here within the arrange window. Likewise on the left, this is our inspector. And what that does is that allows you to look at an individual channel and what is going on with said channel. You can make it go away by clicking the inspector. If you like it, you can leave it open. I'm gonna make it go away because it's not doing anything. Uh, additionally, just to make things a little more easy to see here, I'm gonna change the color of these. Now this is not necessary for mixing, this is just something I do because it helps me differentiate. So you click on whatever you wish to change the color of, in this case is this little piece down here, this little label, and I hold Option and hit the C key, as in color. And you'll notice this cute little palette comes up and it's just really cute. So I'm gonna make the Mojave's brown and I'll make the Audix's orange, whatever. It's gonna help me see. Now I can change all of these here. If you click on the track header, that's what this is called, you can do the same thing. Orange, brown, maybe you're not into fall colors during spring, then you know, make it whatever you want doesn't matter. I just do this so I can more easily visually distinguish between the two. Moving on, before we get into mixing anything, I'm gonna hit Command S and save it because I'm crazy. We need to edit stuff. And so editing in this case is not a corrective procedure. It's simply a procedure to break up these pieces, these single recordings, into movements and to get rid of noise before and after them. Uh, for example, all of this stuff going on here. This doesn't belong in the recording. This has no place in the recording. So what I'm going to do is zoom in 
and I want to go just three seconds before it starts. Now, how much time before or after a piece can depend on the piece. It can depend on the, the nature of what you're doing, but three to four seconds is a good industry standard. So I can see that this starts at about 1812. That's two hours, 18 minutes and 12 seconds, and about three quarters. So I'm gonna back up one, two, three. I'll put my little uh, marker here, uh, playhead, that's called the playhead. And I'll select both of them. And uh, I've set up a shortcut key to slice them. And I really recommend you do the same. Um, for me, it's the backslash key. So I just hit backslash and you'll see that it splits the two up. And I'll show you that again. You just click and then delete these. Now, if you don't have the slice key set up, you're gonna need to go to your tools by hitting escape. And then you go down to skizzers or you press five and you click the skizzers. Now, you'll notice also that you need to have both regions selected. You'll only cut the region that you click on. You want to make certain that both regions are cut precisely the same. So I'll, I'll slice that up just like that and get rid of those pieces. At this point, we need to put a little fade on this right here. So here's something I really like to do. Um, these are your left and right and command click tools. Left click, command click tools. The command click is when you hold the command key, it changes the mouse cursor to your command click tool. In this case, we have a marquee tool, and this is pretty neat. You, you can use this to destroy stuff, or if you wanna just separate stuff, but that's not what we're trying to do. I want to have my fade tool easily accessible. So I just click on that command click tool and I drop it down to fader. And then what I can do is I can hold the command key and click and drag across the region and it pops a fade on. I'm gonna do the same thing down here. Now sadly, you cannot fade both of them simultaneously. That would be neato. So this is a linear fade here. I'm gonna change this into something more exponential and you can do this by holding the command key in the middle here and just click and drag. And this is gonna make that jump a little more drawn out. And the reason this is important is because it takes longer for the noise floor to come up, the sound of the room, the sound of people breathing, uh, air conditioning, anything else that's going on, you really want that out as long as possible. Now, you could bring this all the way down here if you want. I almost find that if the noise floor jumps in too suddenly at the last second, it can be disruptive. So now let's, this is done. This is the first edit here. I'm gonna hit save, command S, and I'm gonna go on to the next movement. So this is where things become a little more involved. Um, where we place the cut after the movement is very important. We don't want it to be too soon and we don't want it to be too late. So I'll usually give it about a three to four second count after the reverberation has died down. So I'm gonna turn up my headphones. and make sure that I can hear really clearly. And that's about good. So I see that it's about 246 and a half. I'm gonna go back and listen one more time and see if that feels right. Another indicator is when the musicians start shuffling around. Usually by the time the musicians are shuffling around is when the piece is really over.
And you can see right there at 247 is when they start rustling all their papers around. So 246 and a half is good. I'm going to select both of them by clicking on one and holding shift, clicking the other. And I'll use my slice shortcut right here. And that cuts it open. So now we've got the second movement here. And I'm going to repeat the same process that I did for the first uh, movement. So I'll press play. And right here is where the piece starts, 257 and a half. One, two, three. Bring it back. Uh, oops. I hit the enter key instead of the slice key. One, two, three. Slice. Shift click both of those. Delete them out. And now let's put uh, the fade on these guys here. So here's what I do. I zoom in nice and close. And I'm going to listen for when the reverb stops, because that's when the fade out begins. And let's put just a little smidge of a... Uh, of a curve to it here and see if that sounds a little more natural. Not much, just a little bit. Very nice. Come on over to here and we want to get this fade in pretty close. Don't want to chop anything off. Same thing. Let's get a curve. I'm just holding command and clicking and dragging that over. Let's see how this sounds. Excellent. I'm going to save that now. So, um, I'm going to show you how to set that slice key because I think it's going to be really helpful. So a really quick tangent here. Logic Pro, Preferences, Key Commands. I'm going to search for Slice and see if that pulls it up. Slice at Markers, no. Oh crap. All right, I don't remember how to do it right now. I'm sorry, I've just wasted your life. Okay, let's move on to three. Cut. Sometimes with music like this, you won't see the waveform until after you've heard the note. And this is why it's important to listen. In this case, it sounds like there's a, a viola off to the right. Or perhaps a cello playing very high that starts this off. So that's before you can even see it. So let's go back. One, two, three. Slice it. Delete, fade, fade, curves. Let's listen for when the reverb ends. Beautiful. On to movement four.
You can hear the air conditioning is really roaring now. That's loud. That's a lot of noise. And in fact, if we want to take a look at it, we can do that with our uh, waves analyzer here. I can just set up a loop. And that's all noise floor. That's terrible. But fortunately, we're going to be able to cut that out using uh, our Waves Z noise. And we're going to take a look at that in a little bit here. So I'll make this last cut and I'll put these final touches on editing the fine. And then we'll move on to some mixing considerations. After we make these edits to the beginning of the fourth movement and the end of the third movement, we'll need to go over applause at the end. Nice. So now we're at the end of our piece here, and this is the sound of people going crazy. Just they're, they're so overcome with glee that they're slapping their hands together. This is what, this is a, a very odd human behavior. Anyways, we can see that the applause spans, uh, we can take a look at our transport right here and see this is 29 minutes and 45 seconds. Excuse me, this is 20, 35 minutes and 31 seconds here. So we can see it spans from about there all the way more than 30 seconds to 36.13. That's too much applause. So how much applause is appropriate? Um, it depends on the nature of the piece. And in this case... Uh, let's give them 20 seconds of applause. If it was a full, uh, magnificent full orchestra work, then 30 to 45 might be more appropriate. But, uh, this is a smaller chamber ensemble, so let's give them 30. So, if this is at 35 minutes and 32 seconds, I'm going to just bring it on up to right about here. That's 36 minutes, so that's 28. Let's back it up. Sure. Slice it. Now, at this point, I can just delete this stuff because this is... I'm going to hit save. And here's how I deal with applause. First thing that we want to do is we want to create an arrange track for our master fader. So we do this by uh, changing its color to black because that's awesome. And then we right click on it, create arrange track, done, okay? And uh, if you want to change the icon here so you can more easily distinguish what you're looking at, you can do that over here. And uh, I'll put like a little tape machine because it's that's going to tape now. And that's just really neat looking. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is just f zoom in on the applause. So this is filling up most of our arrange window here. I'm going to just put a linear fade on it halfway through. Now I'll be putting reverb on this during the mixing phase. 
And so we need to make sure that the reverb tail doesn't extend past these last claps. Because when we put this fade on here, this is fading the audio file. This is not fading the channel output. Those are two very different things. We want to make sure that the total output fades in addition to just the channel because the reverb tail is going to exceed this by one to two seconds depending on the decay time. Here's how we make it happen. We need to automate. We need automation. So we can do this by clicking this automation button over here or we can press the letter A on our keyboard for automation. You'll see some things change. All right. First thing that comes up by default is this gray line here on each channel. And you'll see it says volume. That's your volume automation, okay? I'm gonna click on that line and it says zero dB, excellent. So now I'm gonna create these two dots right here and you'll see why in a moment. And now I just wanna fade out like the last two or three seconds just to make sure that nothing weird happens. So I'll click and you can drag this around and you see you get this little indicator line. So I'll just put that a tiny, tiny smidge before the end of that waveform. And now these are seconds here. Here's about two and a half seconds, perfect. So now I've got four dots on my automation track here for my master volume. Okay, we've got the beginning of the fade, the end of the fade, and then what I suppose we could call some recovery uh, automation points. And here's why. Because I want this to return to zero for the next track. So all I do now is I click and drag this single line down. And now here's the fade out of the last two and a half seconds. Here's a moment of silence when there's nothing going on anyways. And here's automation bringing that channel fader back up. So I can put this here and watch down over here. Watch the, uh, the output right here. And you'll see it says read now. It's not off anymore, it's read. And it's ready for the next one. So my friends, uh, after this you can press the letter A to switch back from automation and zoom out to admire your work now and hit command S to save it. So this process should be repeated for these next two pieces here. The Riley will only need a fade in on the way in. It will need a fade on the applause here and then Riley will be done. And after you do the same thing for Mendelssohn, we'll be ready to start mixing. So I'm going to stop the video at this point and I'll be back momentarily with some mixing stuff. So now's a great time to wrap that stuff up. Uh, go have another two cups of coffee or pet your dog. Okay, we're back. We've made some progress. And at this point, we are ready to move forward with uh, some stuff in Logic, if I can get to it. So there are a couple things I wanted to show you. First of all, I did not fade out the final applause at the end of the Mendelssohn. And there was one spot right here. Where was it? that I wanted to show you about. So this is at the end of the third movement of the Mendelssohn piece. Listen closely. So we've got musicians shuffling around kinda before there's enough time happening. And as is, this cut is three seconds before this piece begins. So in this case, what I would do I mean, if the musicians are moving around, there's nothing you can do about it. It's really good to kind of have that uh, space there anyways. So I'm going to just take these pieces right here, these uh, of this fourth movement, and just create a little space. And then what I'm going to do is fade in from there. 
Just right in between. And I'll fade out this guy here. An amount that's appropriate. So in this case, it's really only about this last two seconds. So sometimes that'll happen. And uh, there's really nothing you can do about it. So I'll zoom in. Get the fade on. We want to make sure that our fades are pretty close to identical. That's slightly steep on the way out. And on the way in, we could have maybe a little more here. A little more slope to it. So this is what it sounds like in the end, essentially. Great, very smooth. So let's go to our applause. And we can see humans just going totally berserk here. This is a solid minute of applause. So this is the last piece. And uh, my dog is also very excited for the end of this movement. And so considering the energy level is just so high in this crowd, Let's give them a full 30 seconds. So we can see it starts at 36.21. So let's come over to about, ah, uh, there, 52. We'll call that good. Select them, slice them, and drop that. Zoom in on the applause. Fade to halfway through. And I'll just leave that linear. We're gonna hit A, check out our automation, and we're gonna put our two second fade out right here. So I'll just click right on the inside of that waveform. Starts at two seconds. Now considering this is the very last piece, it doesn't matter if this comes back up to zero. So I can just drop this down because after that, everybody goes home. No more music. Everyone's going to sleep. It's always good at this point to do two things. Number one. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Okay, okay. It's over, it's over, dude. Dude, it's over. It's over, man. At this point, you should hit Command S to save your progress and sort of double check your fades in and outs and just make sure everything is nice and tight and clean because it's, it's really easy to just fade a little too much or not enough and you're better off going back and listening. Cool. 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 Okay, that sounds cool. Cool. Well, you get the picture. So go through and check your work and check each one and be thorough. I'm also going to hit A to look at my automation and make sure that I've got my fade points where there's applause, and I do. So it's also good to zoom in on that and make sure that that's been done properly for each one. Ah, see, is this okay? Let's check it out, let's make sure. Yeah, it's fine. But you're better off looking is the point. So you're done editing. That's been the editing process. Congratulations. Hit Command S 
because you're obsessed. And now it's time to mix some things. So, um, the first thing I'm going to mention is that your dynamic range is really important and that's what you really need to preserve. And here's how you do it. Um, first of all, I'm going to take both of these faders and pull them down to minus three because they're going to add up over the zero line in a very loud passage. We can always pull them up, but we do not want to clip. This is imperative. So I need to find the loudest passage in the concert this evening. And uh, I need to mention also this is an archival recording. So it's important to preserve the dynamic range, the integrity of the dynamic range within the concert. Like for example, this first piece you can see is quieter, but that's okay. We're not gonna normalize it. We're not gonna crank it up. Maybe we'll add a couple of dB, but we're not gonna do too much to it because on the other hand, this is a louder piece. And on the other hand, you can see our artistic director put the loudest piece at the very end. That's what he's hired to do. So let's listen to this peak right here, and we're gonna watch this output down here, and we're gonna see what that peak's at. Minus 3.3, perfect. Here's a loud spot, let's take a look at this. Minus 3.6, let's check this out here and see. Okay, minus three eight. This is the big to do at the end. Let's listen to this last section. So this is the loudest point in the concert, is the coda here, the finale of Mendelssohn's piece, where it peaked out at minus 3 dB, and that's what th these faders pulled down. Let's put a linear phase EQ on both of these channels, and just make sure that we're getting rid of all of the low end that we don't want in there, and that's going to be stuff below 30 hertz pretty much. So, uh, these are some of my favorite EQs. This is a linear phase low band. And what's different about a linear phase EQ from another EQ is anytime you run an equalizer on something, you actually create an amount of phase shift because there is either an amplifying circuit or an attenuating circuit in there that the electricity has to go through when before at nominal level it does not and so going through this extra circuit creates 
the tiniest amount of time difference in between those affected frequencies and the unaffected frequencies resulting in phase shifting, resulting in smudging of transients. Orchestral music is all about the transients. Okay? So a linear phase EQ, what it does that's genius, is it applies a time delay to unaffected bands equivalent to those of the affected bands. And so the result is you do not get smudged transients. The consequence of this is very clean, very clear EQ. If you want your EQ to add color, this is not the EQ for you. But this is orchestral music. I don't want to add color using my EQs. I'm not producing a pop album. This is not Adele. This is not uh, Justin Bieber. We don't want it. So I've got mine preset to 32 right here because I use it all the time. I'm just going to click that bad boy on. Okay? And this is also going to help mitigate some of the sound in the room. Something else cool about this low band EQ is you can use this selection here to make it more steep or less steep. Uh, the more steep it is, the more rippling effects you get. Read the manual if you're curious about that. I'll just leave it at normal. And what I'm going to do is copy this over to the next channel here. And I do this by holding Command and Option together. If I just hold Command and click and drag it, it's just going to move it over. If I hold Command and Option, it's going to move a copy over. So now both channels have been low cut at 32 hertz. Let's see if that had any change on the output. It did not. So moving on, uh, let's put another linear phase EQ, but we're going to do the broadband this time. The difference between the broadband and the low band is the broadband lets you access uh, 20 to 20, essentially, whereas the low band is only from essentially zero up to two kilohertz. And what I want to do now is I'm going to put uh, just a gentle high frequency roll off. And I can put on this roll off just by clicking here. And also, you can select what kind of curve you want. This is a V slope low pass, is what they're calling this in your linear phase EQ. Now, I'm going to tell you 11 kilohertz is a little too low. So I'm going to pull that all the way to the right. And I want to just solo up these microphones and just listen to them. So all of this sound is coming from just those two Mojave MA-101 match pair microphones in the middle of the chamber orchestra. Here's what I'm listening for as I'm adjusting this EQ. Right now the high end is very clear. I can hear a lot of detail on the strings, and it's actually just a little too much detail. We need to back that down. And so what I'm going to do is listen very closely and press play. And I'm going to move this around until I get a balance that I like. And I guarantee you it's going to be somewhere in between about 12 to 14, maybe 16K. And right there, it sort of starts sounding like an old-timey recording. That's way too low.
that's sounding pretty good right there. So let's listen, let's A, B it. Here's without it, and I'll turn it on. Let's settle with that. So listening back, I kind of wish the microphones were just slightly farther from the orchestra. This can be hard to do in a lot of live performances because you've got the audience, you don't want microphones on top of people or inside people. So there needs to be distance between the audience to the microphones. Um, and, and that also helps mitigate coughing sounds, rustling sounds. People open candy wrappers or, you know, uh, make smoothies in the audience, all kinds of stuff like that, and you just don't want to record that. Now, is it always necessary to put a high-end roll-off on the recordings? No. It depends on the microphones, it depends on the venue, it depends on the proximity to the performers. There are a lot of factors that go into that, but in this case, it's necessary. So now, we want to do the same thing for the other pair of microphones. And just to give you a little insight to what you're listening to, this ORTF pair is a pair that's 110 degrees spread apart with nine inches of space between the diaphragms. It's about 17 centimeters. Um, now about 12 feet out from those, we have our flank microphones. And these are this is essentially an AB Omni setup. They're just individual Omni microphones with a, a big spread to them. And this is where we really derive the width of the orchestra from. So let's listen back to that same section, solo up our flank microphones, and I'm gonna copy that EQ over. And that'll serve as a, as a starting point. And I'll just hit play. And something else you'll notice as you're listening back Really listen critically and think about what you just heard and the stereo image versus what you'll hear now. And what you're going to notice is a great degree of separation between these channels. You're going to hear a hole in the middle. And that's why these two arrays work so well together. The ORTF fills in the middle and the flanks on the outside capture the width and the space, a real sense of space. Very nice. So let's hear it without it. It's just, it's a little too much detail, a little too much air. So when we finally get that EQ clicked in, it sounds good. So at this point, we've got a roll off a high-end roll-off on uh, both of our pairs of microphones. Let's hear what they sound like together. That's just our flanks. Here's just our ORTF. Here they are together.
So you can hear that the, the flanks pull it out to the sides a little bit. Let's check the balance and see if we like them equal, or let's see if we like it with a little less of the flanks. I have to say I like that right there. Let's listen to a different piece and see how it sounds. Sounding very good to me. Let's listen to this first piece. Okay, cool. Now it's time to uh, add a little reverb and handle some other cool stuff. So the first thing that we need to do now is um, I'd really like to add some noise reduction before we add reverb. It would be easiest really to just um, add the reverb with an aux send and call it a day. But what I like to do that's slightly different, and you know what, now we're just mixing, so I'm gonna just pop open the mixing window here. And I can actually close that. So now, uh, if Logic wants to work, here we go. It's not Logic, it's because I'm running QuickTime, and QuickTime is jacking stuff up. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Right now, these are assigned to stereo out. Okay. Let's change this to a bus. Let's go to bus one because that's the first bus. So here's what's happened now is these are no longer sending to our stereo output. They're sending to this aux, which is then sending to stereo out. This is our auxiliary channel strip. I'm going to change the color of this because I think it's cool if it looks like it's silver, like it's just part of the console. Um, although it doesn't really seem to want to listen to me. Okay, fine. It doesn't want to change color. From here, we're going to create our reverb send. And that's because we're going to put our noise reduction on this channel here, and I'm gonna actually name this NR. Okay, so I've changed this to say NR for noise reduction. I've changed the color to silver. Now this is our reverb, so I'm gonna double click on this and name it RVB. I like purple for reverb. I don't know why, I guess it's because it's the 80s. And I'm gonna pull this fader all the way down, because this is how I roll. Uh, this bus right here, I'm gonna just option click on the send so that it comes up to zero. You can see this is your your send right here and I want it to be at zero because that's nominal. That means it's neither attenuating nor boosting the signal. And I don't care if this is post fader or post pan. As long as it's not pre fader, I'll put it post pan. Although we're not going to change the pan at all. This is your pan knob right here. So um now, let's uh, instantiate a reverb on here. And in this case, I'd like to use our Waves Renaissance reverb because it tends to sound really nice, just stock even. So here's our R-verb. 
And there are a couple of important parameters to get your hands on. The first thing I'm going to direct your attention to, let's go left to right, is pre-delay. Pre-delay is the amount of time that the reverb is delayed from occurring. Now this is important in creating a sense of depth or a sense of space because in reality it takes time for sound to travel. And pre-delay is in milliseconds and that's convenient because sound moves at approximately one foot per millisecond. It's actually 1.1 feet uh, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit per millisecond, but you know, a tenth of a millisecond, I'm not gonna freak out about. So how far back is the audience? Well, I know this hall, and I'm gonna say that the first people in the audience are probably about 15 feet from the orchestra, and the farthest are probably 40 to 50. So let's just make it 20 second pre-delay. And so what that's gonna do is make it sound like you're slightly farther back in the orchestra. 2.40 second reverb tail is kind of big. Let's just set it at two for now. We don't want to, I'm not going to adjust the size or the diffusion. I think the hall sounds great. This stuff I'm gonna just leave as it is because we want the full reverb here. Wet, dry, we want 100% because this is on another auxiliary channel strip. If this was, if you had instantiated this on the actual channel for whatever reason, then you would want more of the dry signal. In this case, it's all wet. Yeah, so um, over here you'll also see a reverb EQ. And you'll see that the default plugin has this nice little roll off on the high end here to smooth things out a little bit. I'm going to bring that up just a bit because we've already sort of taken out some high end from the, the orchestra itself. Let's put a, leave a little in the reverb so the reverb has more of a brightness to it. This is gonna dull down the reverb. Uh, let's have it a little bright and see kind of what happens. Okay, so um, our noise reduction still isn't plugged in and that's because the noise reduction takes a lot of resources in Logic. Uh, also, this is a great time if you haven't done it Check your preferences, and you do that with command comma, and under audio, and under general, we want to make sure that plugin latency compensation is on all. And now what this is going to do is any kind of latency delay that would be caused by these processor intensive plugins like a linear phase EQ, or like a uh, noise reduction, will not result in any kind of conflict or jumbling of the sound because stuff is too delayed. And let's listen and turn up the reverb. So I'm gonna go over to this Riley piece because it's got uh, some nice percussion action going on. And let's listen and turn up the reverb. I can sort of hear the low end of that air conditioner in the background. I can press stop and hear how the tail sounds, where it tails out. That's a pretty nice ratio right there.
let's listen to the end of the Mendelssohn and see where our volume hits on our output as well as what things are sounding like. Because this is sounding pretty good to me. Okay, okay, cool, it's good. Let's, let's go with that. Uh, uh, let's listen back to one more thing. You know, it's, it's easy to move too quick sometimes. Let's, um, let's drop this reverb by just a little bit and see what that sounds like. So I ended up deciding that I like the, uh, reverb down here at minus 10.4 db. 8 was just a little too much. Even though it's pleasant to listen to, I think it was somewhat drowning out what we needed to be hearing. Now it's time to do noise reduction. And you'll see that at the end of the second movement of the Mendelssohn here, I've left this unfaded. And the reason is This is a great spot to do some noise reduction. So what you want to do is kind of create a loop where the the noise in the background is as seamless as possible. So like if I leave this here, let's listen. You get that little pop, that little t kind of sound, right? So let's just change the size of that a little bit. And now it's totally smooth. In the background, it sounds like someone picks their nose or perhaps just flips a page in their program. Now it's time to use noise reduction on this section. So I go inserts. I'm going to go to my waves, Z noise. And I do this last because this is the most processor intensive plugin that we'll be using. You've got some really cool features on this uh, noise reduction software. Uh, the main things I'm going to draw your attention to are this optimize area. I just leave this on norm because that's somewhere in between uh, good for punch and good for smooth. The orchestra does both. This is the noise profile. We're going to learn the noise. And then down here, I keep this transients at about 20. And what this does is this helps the noise reduction software anticipate uh, allowing through transients played by the orchestra. If you have this number too low, it's going to smudge over the orchestra's performance. So I'll click Learn, and I'll hit Play. And you'll see now it's learning. Now it's going to learn this noise profile. I just let it, you only need to let it run through once. And now I click learning, and there it is. That's the noise profile of the room. Okay. This is all of the junk that we don't want to hear. So I'll turn off our cycle by just pressing the C key, or you can click down here on the cycle, or you can click on the cycle itself by turning it to turn it on or off. I'll just uh, hit the C key. Now let's get the fade proper here. As we should. Listen to it, make sure it's okay. And you'll notice that the noise hasn't been reduced yet. Well, that's because we haven't applied the threshold or reduction yet. So let's go ahead and cycle this up. And let's start messing with some things. So here's what you're looking at. The threshold is the volume level at which it begins applying the noise reduction, OK? And the reduction is the amount of noise reduction. But you never would have guessed that. 
So for starters, I'll usually put this up at about three and a half and then start pulling up the reduction and let's see the difference in sound. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be better. And that's really the question here. If you were to try to remove all of the noise, you would actually affect too much of the harmonic content of the instruments. So one way to check is you can click over here and listen to difference on your monitor. And all it sounds like is air blowing through a tube. That's perfect. And I don't really hear anything that pertains to instruments. So let's listen back to audio. So while it's still there, it's better. Let's bypass it and listen without it. I mean, the difference is huge. It sounds like it, the orchestra is actually in a building as opposed to on an airplane. Let's turn off the cycle and listen to another section. Let's listen to something something else that's kind of low level. Let's check out this. Here's the difference. Man, that's great. So in just a few simple yet well-placed plugins, here's what we've managed to do. I can turn all of this stuff off now by option clicking on it. Here's what we had before. Which is a nice recording to begin with. But let's turn these things on. Turn on our equalizers, our noise reduction, and our reverb. Ah. And that's a much more pleasant sound to listen to. There's only one last thing to do before we start bouncing things out, I guess, uh, and that's check the volume on these pieces because we want to eat up as much of that headroom as possible on our output, okay? So what I'm going to do is listen back to that loudest point in the concert again. Now that we've applied all of our processes and see how much space we've got on our volume meter. So we're going to watch our output meter right down here. Four point four dB of headroom. Let's eat that up. So I'm going to grab both of these, and let's put th when you when you grab multiple faders in Logic and you move them together, it maintains the ratio, which is really cool. It maintains that balance. So let's move that up just a little bit and see where that takes us. minus 2.9. So my goal is to actually hit at minus 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. I 
I'll tell you what. Let's do this. 1.4 dB is quite good. So now, I'm going to pull the analyzer down by just command clicking it down. And let's put just a, a limiter up there for just that top half a decibel. That's it. And to do this, I'm going to put the uh, Renaissance compressor. And the Renaissance compressor has this really interesting little feature to it. I don't know if it's a glitch or not. But you can use it as a limiter by turning up the gain. So we're hitting at minus 1.4. I'm just going to say 2. And that actually compresses too much. Let's say 1. Let's see what happens. at minus 0 0.4, let's say 1.2. Go over that same section again. See what happens if I go to 1.3. This is now perfect, and here's why. I've used the Renaissance compressor strictly for gain. I haven't used it to limit in any fashion at all. We're hitting at minus 0 0.1 on our output fader. We have, in effect, completely and perfectly maintained the dynamic range of this concert while making it as loud as possible and without hitting zero. The reason I like to leave a tenth of a decibel on the output is just because playback on some devices may result in distortion the the process of burning to a CD may result in some kind of distortion depending on the quality of the CD or the CD burner. And that tenth of a decibel is, first of all, hardly even audible by any human stretch of, of hearing, if at all. And it's going to give us that headroom. So now that we've listened to the loudest part, I'm going to listen to the softest part of the concert here and just see where that's landing. So the meters are at minus 13, which is, by pop standards, unacceptably low. But in the orchestral world, this is just what's going on. And it sounds great. And the reason that those volume differences are so important is because the pieces are intended to be quiet or intended to be loud. And for me to go and change the volume respective between each of these pieces would in fact be taking away from the musician's work that they've done. So this is done. I'm gonna hit Command S and save it. And this concert is now mixed. It is edited. And at this point, it just needs to be bounced out, which is going to take time. Uh, this concert was recorded at 88.2.
I always try to record it at least 96k, but um, I was not there for this and the equipment we were using couldn't go above 88.2, so it was the maximum. And now it's ready to bounce, and so all you want to do is select those, set your locators, and then how I'll name the file depends on the name of the piece. So let's pull up our, um, our program here. This is Fine Suite for Strings. This is a world premiere. This is a really important piece. Hmm. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, once again, this is Editing and Mixing the Orchestra by Adam Lansky. This is a very basic introductory overview to editing and mixing the orchestra. Uh, there are plenty of other things we could do to potentially alter or mix the recording, including some mastering EQ to bring some balance to the mids, if necessary, or to the lows. But uh, if you've enjoyed this video, click like, feel free to comment on it, and let me know if you would like some more of this kind of stuff. But uh, I hope you've learned something and I hope it's been insightful to you. Thank you so much for watching. Find us on Facebook, Lansky Sound. Visit LanskySound.com. If you have questions, email or write or call or uh, send a carrier pigeon, you know, interpretive dance, whatever you're doing these days. Thanks so much.